With Mania hot off the presses, I've been itching to play me some Sonic the Hedgehog. I have an unbridled passion for the series that, if left unchecked, will prove somewhat dangerous. I started with Sonic and Knuckles on PC, and I have vivid memories of Mushroom Hill Zone. The cool music, the bouncy mushrooms, the weird pulley things. Unfortunately, that's all the nostalgic memory I have of Sonic and Knuckles, because I never did get past Mushroom Hill Zone, no matter how much I played. I wasn't the brightest kid on the block. Then I got Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, Sonic Adventure DX, Sonic Heroes, Shadow, 06, you get the picture. I've been a fan for a very long time, yet the classic games were never on my radar. I dabbled in Advance and Sonic 4, but never the classic the trilogy. I tried a level or two of the older Sonic games through Sonic Adventure DX, and while it gave me some very nostalgic memories of Sonic 1 on the Game Gear, I'd rather have been playing Emerald Coast or Speed Highway. It wasn't until several years ago that I actually tried playing the classic games, and if you watched my Sonic Mania video, I wasn't a big fan initially. I could never place why, there was just something about classic Sonic that felt… unexciting. A lot of that misplaced displeasure was because I decided to start where it all began. Sonic the Hedgehog. The real Sonic the Hedgehog. It's criminal, really. Sonic the Hedgehog begins unlike any video game I've ever played. You're in a grassy plain with racing stripes, mechanical bees, and beetles flying around at a peppy music track. Green Hill is so iconic that its overuse is a major point of contention. There's only so many times you can hear the start-up to Green Hill before you groan a little, no matter how catchy that tune. No matter how beautiful that background art. No matter how unique the stage. Green Hill is so iconic, it hurts. Fortunately, what never suffers is the superb level design, nearly unmatched even in its own series. To really dig our teeth into why Green Hill is so fantastic, we first must start with Sonic's unique momentum-based physics. While Sonic fans enjoy throwing the word physics around, I'm not sure the idea is fully understood the way it probably should be. Yuji Naka's design goal from the very beginning was to make a game not unlike Mario, but with a focus on speedrunning, prioritizing a one-button control scheme, and of course to craft the fastest moving character in video games. To achieve this, the game required two things. A control scheme that sparks speed, and levels designed to keep it. Sonic has a strong sense of weight attributed to every action he performs. You are in your speed by running in a line until Sonic reaches top speed, indicated by his spinning legs. Turning is slow, since Sonic needs to regain the speed he loses when coming to a stop. Rolling into a ball on a slope will cause Sonic to move faster than he can normally, reaching enormous speeds that can be utilized on inclines to jump incredibly high. There is a resistance to forward movement on a curve or slope, forcing you to attain the speed necessary to overcome said incline. Most zones are not straight lines, they have slopes of varying sizes that affect Sonic's speed, jump height, and jump direction. If you were to jump repeatedly without moving the control stick, Sonic will jump off the slope under him, likely making him jump side to side. His controls are unlike any other platformer at the time, especially Mario. Mario is extremely straightforward. Flat terrain with obstacles, a linear path to the end with isolated secrets laid in along that singular path. Sonic has more complex controls, and is extremely non-linear, at least in theory. There are secrets hidden all throughout, but there are also multiple pathways you can take depending on where you decide to go. If you take the upper path, you can find ring boxes that aren't on the lower path, and you can even finish the level faster if you take one path over the other. You can reach different pathways usually by spotting where the entrance to each one is, or you can use the level geometry and the physics to your advantage in order to finagle your way somewhere interesting. For instance, take any slope in Green Hill Zone. Gain some speed and jump somewhere on that slope. Sonic will jump higher if he's going faster, and depending on the angle of the slope, you can rocket your way in the opposite direction. 
Sometimes you even need to ensure you nab something earlier on so you can achieve that speed in the first place. In Green Hill Zone Act 2, there's a really cool secret on top of a loop, an extra life, and a ton of rings. No matter how hard you try, you'll be hard pressed to get on top of that loop even if you run at top speed and jump off the slope to your left. However, if you take the lower pathway at the very beginning of the level, you can get some speed shoes, which is just what you need in order to get the life box. Green Hill Zone is teeming with stuff like this. High up areas, hidden passageways, extra life boxes. You're encouraged to explore for as many lives as you can to avoid a game over, and for as many rings as possible to keep yourself alive and to make a special stage ring appear at the end. I could play Green Hill over and over again for the rest of my life. It's the perfect first level. It's why I think so many people stuck around with Sonic till the end. Playing around in Green Hill Zone, at least for me, sparks a feeling I can't get with Mario or Castlevania. Both are tight, difficult platformers, but they don't handle a physics system as multi-layered as Sonic. If the level design didn't take advantage of everything Sonic has to offer, I think it'd be much worse than the likes of Mario or Castlevania. Which is where Sonic the Hedgehog trips up quite substantially. Green Hill Zone is a marvelous starting point, but what comes after? Marble Zone, one of the biggest pace breakers in video game history. Yuji Naka explained that with Sonic's focus on speed, it would make sense to have levels that give you a chance to catch your breath. This is a very admirable goal, and I don't wish to take away from that, but I don't think Marble Zone, or Labyrinth Zone for that matter, are great ways to accomplish this. Largely, I think it's a misunderstanding of how Sonic actually plays. If you don't know what you're talking about, you'd probably say Sonic is only about going at blindingly fast speeds and nothing else. With this mindset, it'd be understandable that chill zones would be necessary to keep the player in check and manage the exhilarating high points of mock speed. The problem is that each of the good levels are already paced with that in mind. You don't start Green Hill Zone by running into a booster that will launch you into mock speed, holding right to win while jumping over obstacles. I mean, maybe if you're a speedrunner, but for any other player, there are built-in segments meant to keep the game in check. If you decide to explore for a secret, you're breaking the pace of the level quite intentionally, and if you're exploring a higher path, you'll likely be doing some bog-standard platforming to get there. These segments in and of themselves provide a sufficient break from the faster segments, which aren't actually very common in the original. Loops and tubes launch you fast and far, but it's not like these set pieces are placed everywhere. They come in chunks to make sure you're doing something other than going fast. If that wasn't enough, there's a point tally screen for each of the three acts, and a potential special stage to clear. Special stages don't require any speed, they're precision-based challenges. Disregarding the special stages, there's definitely enough here to keep the player chill, and if the future games are anything to go by, zones like Marble and Labyrinth are not at all needed. Of course, that particular point is riddled with hindsight bias. All I'm trying to say is that the execution of this philosophy is far too ham-fisted. We should examine Marble more thoroughly, then, to get to the bottom of why it's such a departure. Entering Marble is akin to Whiplash coming off the spectacularly designed Green Hill Zone. Glancing at a sprite map of both, it's easy to see where the differences begin. Marble Zone, while not 100% linear in its design, is lacking Green Hill's open nature. There's a big stretch of land with moving platforms, badniks, and lava. Once you get underground, there's block pushing and a whole lot of waiting. I do mean a lot of waiting. Spike platforms waiting to lower, blocks floating across giant chasms of lava, fireballs, disappearing blocks. Marble Zone runs the gambit of pace breakers. While there is some tight platforming here and there, I would argue that tight platforming isn't the strength of Sonic in the first place. I welcome the difficulty, but it certainly doesn't excuse the sections of the level where literally nothing is happening. I don't even like this stuff in Mario games, so you can imagine how impatient I get at level set pieces that are timed to always make you wait. See this spike platform you need to jump on? No matter the speed at which you clear the level, it's time to always drop when it appears on screen, meaning you will never get there too early or too late. It's predetermined to make you wait. This moment is further compounded by being the only path through this act, meaning you'll always get to this section, you'll always have to wait, and this is a common pattern with most of the pace-breaking segments of Marble. Act 3 has the only chance in the entire zone to take a separate pathway, but it links up with the main pathway faster than a Mass Effect dialogue tree. Multiple pathways are fun to play around with because they're long, provide a bunch of exclusive secrets, and you can switch between them at will. Suppose you fall from the top pathway to a lower pathway. You've just lost the privilege to explore the top pathway via failing an informal skill check. It feels very rewarding to make your way to the top, stay on top, and clear the act. 
you get no sense of satisfaction in marble. There's only one secret in the entire zone that I like going after, hidden behind an invisible wall above a spike platform. There's an extra life hidden inside, and if you move forward, you'll skip an entire segment of the level. It's rewarding to find, and you skip a few of the moving platform segments that, as you'd expect, offer very little in terms of real difficulty. Not to say there aren't any other secrets hidden in the zone, but they're much the same. Singular room with a few rings and item boxes, then you're spit right back into the linear progression. Marble Zone is a Mario level, without any of the nuance that makes a good Mario level. There's no difficulty or thematic progression, it's just an assortment of random, waiting-based platforming challenges that offer very little in the way of skill and are offset by the leniency of the ring system. I posit the ring system was introduced to compensate for enemies you didn't anticipate or stage obstacles that harm your momentum. You can collect at least one ring and stay safe, it's the safety net keeping some of the faster levels from becoming frustrating. The problem is that if you're making a Mario-like level, Sonic can tank hits, collect a ring, rinse repeat until you pass a segment where you were supposed to be waiting for platforms or moving blocks. You probably won't do this on a first or second playthrough, especially because you need at least 50 rings for the special stage at the end of the act. However, for experienced players, Marble Zone's pace breakers are swiftly averted. Did you know the footage I've been using for the past few seconds was of a speedrun I lifted from TNT314? I honestly wouldn't blame you if you didn't notice, this looks nothing like a speedrun. He uses glitches to pass Acts 2 and 3, of course, but my point is that not even speedruns can make Marble Zone appealing, and they need to save time on the spike platforms by intentionally harming themselves in a way that feels inorganic. Isn't it weird, then, that Spring Yard Zone is almost Green Hill levels of quality? There are speedy sections with ramps, bumpers, and halfpipes. Secrets can sometimes only be found by jumping off halfpipes with the right speed and timing. I particularly love a secret at the beginning of the first act, something I didn't know about until relatively recently. If you hit the red bumper up this ramp, off to your left is a moving platform. If you can spot it and land on it, you'll net yourself an extra life and a ton of rings. We're back to the good old days of running around, finding cool secrets, trying to stay on the fastest path without falling down to a lower path, or even outrunning a moving block before it blocks off a faster path, forcing you to take the longer, platform-heavy path. Yet, as good as all this is, as evocative of Green Hill as it is, it falls short in a few areas. Platforms that raise and lower in sync with each other, where you have no choice but to wait for an opening and hope to god you don't move too soon and get crushed by the strange crusher hitboxes. This is also where I feel a worrying trend in every classic game began with strange enemy placement. Green Hill didn't really suffer from this problem, at least not noticeably, because it felt much more open and enemies were generally in your path only when you were already in a ball, or when they were clearly in sight after a rock or other harmless stage obstacle halted your momentum. Spring Yard has a few sections where you rocket up from a spring, which takes you out of your ball form, and since you're so high up, you can't see below you until you already hit an enemy. To make matters worse, even if you're in ball form, some of those enemies have spikes on top of them, so you're screwed either way. There's also a robot that mimics Sonic with a spin dash of his own, and will follow after you in the levels. If you aren't in a ball here, you'll get hit by something you could barely see coming. None of this harms the level enough for me to hate it, especially since it's fairly faithful to the design philosophy of Green Hill, but it further supports a statement of mine that Sonic 1 peaks at Green Hill Zone and never fully recovers. I can hardly fault the developers in this instance, though. I imagine it's hard to create a difficulty curve for Sonic that feels as fair and organic as Mario. You need a cute reaction timing in Sonic games, what with his increased speed, so hitting an enemy is probably going to be more unfair inherently than it is in Mario, where you have plenty of time to react. That said, I think a panning camera should have been considered. Mario adopted one when I would argue he didn't even need it. If Sonic 1 had a panning camera, it would be much easier to dismiss the enemies that come flying out of nowhere, and you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about placing more of them in the later levels. I love Green Hill Zone, but even I have to admit it's far too easy for its own good. Having every level be a carbon copy of Green Hill Zone would make for quite the cakewalk. Starlight is much the same, but I'd argue it's even worse than Spring Yard. There are cool set pieces and loops for speed's sake, but these invincible bomb enemies are total pace breakers, and the sections with bottomless pits should not be in places where you can easily speed into them. It follows the same philosophy, so it's fun on a base level, but it needs to be a little harder than everything else. This is when we start entering some iffy territory in terms of level design. I only somewhat enjoy my time in Starlight. Though, it's admittedly a lot more than I enjoy Marble, Scrap Brain, or... <laughs> Labyrinth.
Oh boy, I'm pretty sure Labyrinth is hated by everyone on planet Earth. Not only is it a water level, but it also follows the overbearingly linear design of Marble Zone, while also attempting to be more difficult than anything before it. Sonic handles the same underwater, but everything happens at a slower pace. Imagine setting a YouTube video to 0.5 times speed, that's basically what it feels like. Sonic can drown if you don't get him enough air, so you're constantly on the hunt for air bubble spawners, waiting for an air bubble, doing some mediocre underwater platforming around spike balls, and very annoying spike ball enemies. Asking the player to adjust to a gameplay style for Sonic where he moves at 10 frames a second is unbearable. Ironic seeing as there are a few segments where it actually does run at 10 frames a second. Labyrinth follows the Marble Zone design philosophy of a straight, linear path and only a couple deviations, though Act 3 has a much more substantial deviation than the one in Marble Zone. It's still not the same as Green Hill, and it has the added benefit of controlling like you're walking through molasses, so I wouldn't exactly call it a step up from Marble just yet. There's a surprising lack of secrets here. You're mostly expected to play it all straight, and while there aren't as many segments where you have to wait for movable platforms, you can bet your ass they still exist in a frustrating enough quantity. Labyrinth even goes as far as to highlight one of the most frustrating problems Sonic 1 has revolving around invincibility frames and spikes. For some reason, either a bug or an intentional design choice, Sonic will still take damage from spikes even when he has invincibility frames. This means that if you get hit by anything, be it a set of spikes or an enemy, and then fall into another bed of spikes from the knockback, you instantly die. No questions asked because you can't pick up the rings you lost. Isn't that... Fun? Scrap Brain isn't much better, you get enemies, death traps, spikes, all that wonderful stuff that mixes incredibly well with Sonic, am I right? The zone expands again, which is nice, but it also tries to heighten the difficulty with all that puke I just mentioned. Act 3 is just a rehash of Labyrinth Zone, a very, very long rehash. Air bubbles take longer to spawn, there are even more stage hazards because it's the final fucking act and you get to deal with fun water physics again. Not to mention that if you game over here, unless you have a continue, you get the pleasure of restarting the entire game. How do you get continues then? By getting 50 rings in a special stage, which you can only access by carrying 50 rings to the ends of Act 1 or 2 of Green Hill, Marble, Spring Yard, Labyrinth, or Starlight. 10 chances for either a continue or one of the 6 Chaos Emeralds. You can't get them in Scrap Brain for no discernible reason, so don't even try. Puke Bag Zone, as Clement aptly put it, might be one of the worst special stages in Sonic history, right next to the Sonic 2 halfpipes. Now, here's the thing. At least the Sonic 2 halfpipes can eventually be memorized so you can clear them flawlessly. Sonic 1's special stages feel like crapshoots. The stage is constantly spinning around, and you can make it faster, slower, or rotate the other way by rolling over specific circles on the walls. There are bumpers that push you around the tight, claustrophobic hallways, and of course, there are some fun exclamation mark circles that boot you out of the special stage immediately. You can bet they're always very well placed next to some bumpers. There's one specific special stage that, upon starting, if you don't move within the first couple milliseconds, the bumper boops you straight into some exclamation circles, a blatant middle finger that is very welcome. If you're going after the Chaos Emeralds, good luck getting all six of them out of the ten chances you have. If you're there for continues, I guess it could prove lucrative provided you're even able to get to a special ring in the first place. You'll probably only ever see one in Green Hill Zone, which means your chance for a continue is basically two acts, unless you know the game so well that you can avoid taking damage in Marble onward. At that point though, do you really need the continues? Limited continues are so much fun, aren't they? Especially when paired with late game difficulty design. Whenever I tell someone I'm not a huge fan of Sonic 1, I usually get some strange looks, because for the most part, people either love it or at least like it enough to want to play it a bunch. I adore Green Hill Zone, and I always will, because that's when I get the most fun out of Sonic's unique control and multi-layered level design. This peak moment for Sonic will always be more fun than Mario, but it's pretty easy for me to tell that they had no idea what they were doing other than make something faster and better than Mario. Try as they might, Mario is pretty fucking great. He's slower for a reason, he controls the way he does for a reason, his levels are designed the way they are for a reason, his bosses are designed the way they are for a reason. Mario is the quintessential 2D challenge-based platforming game. Sonic 1 screws around with its potential by introducing pace-breaking zones in the form of Marble, Labyrinth, and Scrap Brain, while never truly reaching its peak in the zones that are supposed to be faster, like Spring Yard or Starlight. At the end of the day, I can only say I have a consistent amount of fun at the beginning, and it's why my most consistent jumping off point is always Marble. For the longest time, I wrote this game off as a failed science experiment. That is until I happened upon the mobile port. 
a save system, widescreen support, a stable frame rate, Tails and Knuckles as playable characters, fixed bugs, and they even added the spin dash. Everything I've just listed improves the game substantially. If you can get blue stacks running, you'll even be able to play this on your computer with a controller. It's seriously Sonic 1 in perfect form. I have no idea why it's not on Steam yet. Sonic CD is what the fuck is the wait, Sega? <clears throat> The save system ensures that you don't need to worry about game overs anymore, you can select whichever stage you stopped at. It also saves your emerald count, so you can redo Green Hill Zone over and over for all six emeralds in the good ending if you truly want it. The special stages run at a decent frame rate now, you get so much more reaction time with the added screen space, and the removal of the spike bug improves every single section of the game that has spikes in it. AKA almost every zone. The addition of Tails and Knuckles is huge and gives you incentive to both beat the game for Tails and collect all of the emeralds for Knuckles. They both have a few secrets added in that take advantage of their unique abilities, and though they don't always feel like they fit with the level design, having them as options is so damn cool. Spring Yard and Starlight are so much more fun now, and playing as Knuckles or Tails in Marble, Labyrinth, or Scrap Brain makes those zones so much less frustrating, allowing you to completely bypass the problematic waiting segments. You can even get Supersonic in Debug Mode. This mobile port is so good. You know that meme where you press upgrade on the keyboard? Yeah, this is that. Playing through the mobile port after the original didn't feel like a chore, and I can tell you right now, I'm never going back to the original. I don't think I could ever adjust to 4x3 again, or the crappy frame rate, or the spike bug, or the limited continue system. I can enjoy Sonic 1 with a mobile port, and I can do it on the go with touch controls that work far better than they have any right to. I'm not trying to exaggerate here, it's just that much of an improvement. So much so that I hesitate to say Sonic 1 is inherently a badly designed game. The fact that you can improve the game substantially by adding or removing a few minor things speaks volumes about how fun Sonic 1 actually is when it wants to be. I might never enjoy Marble, Labyrinth, or Scrap Brain, but I can at least enjoy Green Hill, Spring Yard, and Starlight with relatively little issue thanks to the larger screen size and a super convenient save system. It'll never be my go-to Sonic game, nor will it ever be my go-to platformer, but at least on mobile it's a fun enough distraction from the world around me. It allows me to enjoy what makes Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic the Hedgehog, even if it only happens in spurts. Next up, we'll be taking a look at Sonic the Hedgehog 2, a direct sequel to Sonic the Hedgehog. We'll look at how it evolves Green Hill Zone's play philosophy, how it focuses more on speed and spectacle, and how it handles the ever-pervasive issue of difficulty. All this and more coming very soon. For now, let me know what you thought. Am I stupid? Don't worry, you can tell me. Just be civil, please. If you liked what I had to say, I've got a Patreon where you can support me in my attempt to make this a career. I would like nothing more than to create high quality analysis videos for you on a fairly regular basis, so if you have the spare change, I'd really appreciate it. Sub, like, dislike, I don't really care, I just hope you enjoyed the video at the very least. My name has been King K, and I certainly hope you have some well-deserved fun today.